part of that. Because uh, it was September 7th of 1967, a Thursday. I remember that very well. And uh, we had just uh, come out publicly with the Church of All Worlds. We decided, okay, we're going to make a splash. We'd had long debates about whether we wanted to keep this kind of an underground secret society, which is how it had been for the previous five years since 62 when we began. And right about that time, though, we, it became a major debate. Should we keep the secret or should we bring it public? And we decided to do both, which is our usual typical approach to things. Um, and so I was selected to, to do the public aspect of it. My first water brother, Lance, uh, headed up the, the other side, which was sort of stay in the background. And was eventually incorporated as the Association for the Tree of Life. And Lance and I were lifetime, oh, Kirk and Spock to each other, really, is what our relationship was. Um, him being the Spock, which should say enough about me to keep you entertained. And um, so we decided to, okay, we're going to bring it out. We're going to come out of the closet and see what happens. So we did a thing about with the Church of All Worlds, and somebody asked the faithful question. He said, well, what kind of a church is this? Are you some one of these Christian sects? Are you one of these Eastern cults? Or, you know, or there was like the Boonies and the Krishna people, and everybody was coming out with these new funny religions. And they wanted to know, which is a fair enough question. And I said, well, I guess you could say we're pagans. And that appears to have been the first time that that phrase was ever used. Uh, pagans had always been a word that people used to refer to other people as a derogatory term. All oh, those pagans, you know, or we got to send missionaries out to convert the pagan babies and stuff like that. And, uh, well, that's how it began. And it grew and spread from that seed. And now look at this. When I left St. Louis in uh, Morning Glory in 1976, there was a, a small handful of us, you know, Don and Tom were among the the CAW members who were still left behind, and you know, a few, uh, there was a few witches, and, but not a whole lot of people. So to come back all these years later to this, it's it's glorious, you know, it's, it's like, I feel like Johnny Appleseed going around and dropping seeds, and <laughs> coming back a few years later, and here's this entire <coughs> forest of uh, apple trees, beautiful. So anyway, okay, well with everybody here, I'm gonna launch into this little talk here. The uh, subject is awakening into quantum consciousness, which throws in a whole lot of catchwords all in one phrase, <coughs> but they're all relevant. The uh, quantum theory has become very popular conversation in the magical community because as the formulae and equations of quantum physics are being developed and articulated, those of us who've been around the magic field for a while are recognizing that these are the same as the laws of magic, which is really interesting because science is finally coming full circle to catching up with magic. Arthur C. Clarke uh, famously said that any sufficiently advanced science is indistinguishable from magic. I think most of you know that phrase. Well, this is a great truth, you see, and here's the difference between a great truth and a small truth. With a small truth, the opposite is false. With a great truth, the opposite is also true. Like, as above, so below, for example. Well, any sufficiently advanced magic is indistinguishable from science. And especially we're seeing that coming together now. And it's really kind of cool, because now we can have these conversations. Because uh, the people in the science camp used to just sort of dismiss all of us silly people who believed in magic. And now we can just turn it around on him and have this conversation. The, uh, the most relevant uh, theorem of quantum physics is the law of entanglement, which is exactly the same as the magical law of association. It says that any two objects, once in contact, remain, retain that contact no matter how far they're separated. But it's not a contact that is transmitted over space like the speed of light is. It's simultaneous, not even instantaneous, totally simultaneous. So if you've got two objects that are entangled and you remove them to far away places like light years apart, anything that happens on one end happens simultaneously on the other end. The possibilities of this for communication and computing are, are staggering. And uh, 
But I, I'm not going to get into that in depth right now because I want to talk about some other stuff here. Throughout history, there have been many cycles. There have been, uh, well, one of the biggest cycles that we experience on Earth uh, for the last half a billion years that there has been life on Earth, complex life that is, has been um, a cycle of extinctions. There, there have been five great extinctions in the past half a billion years, in which up to 98% of all life on Earth has been exterminated. And yet somehow, each time this happens, like, like a hologram being reproduced from a single little cell, you know, the, the planetary DNA is able to reproduce an entire biosphere. And this has happened five times, but there have also been a number of smaller extinctions, a total of 13 in all that we've recorded for the last half a billion years. And um, if you add all of them together, not just the five biggies, but add all the rest of them, you have a cycle of 37 million years between them. It averages out really neatly. So the question has been, what is it in the cosmos that has a period of 37 million years that would account for these? And only recently was that figured out, as, we're, as our deep space Hubble telescope stuff has been more informative. And that is that as the solar system moves through the plane of the galaxy, this is the plane of the galaxy, um, it doesn't just move in a straight line. It's, it's moving in its own cycle. So it kind of goes around and down and up and down through the plane of the galaxy. And the times that it passes through the denser dust and, and debris of the galactic plane happens to be every 37 million years. In which case we pick up a lot of debris and it comes crashing down on Earth and, and we have to start all over again. But the important thing is we do start all over again successfully. And uh, hopefully we're getting to the point, um, as uh, James Lovelock uh, uh, proposed, that maybe Gaia has developed some way of going out there and stopping this stuff before it comes down. And this may be one of our most important functions, is to be able to go out there and create a shield to protect us from more of this stuff. <coughs> but I mentioned half a billion years ago, <coughs> the Earth is estimated to be about four and a half billion years. So that's a long time. As soon as the Earth cooled down enough for there to be liquid water standing on the surface that wouldn't boil away, there was life in that water, single cell life. And single cell life persisted and expanded and filled the seas as the seas filled up, because all the light, all the water on Earth has come from space. Uh, space is full of this stuff. Earth isn't the only water place at all, it's everywhere. And it's coming in constantly. We found the, the, the oceans of Mars are still there. They're just frozen underneath the sands, you know. There's water in the, uh, enough uh, ice in the craters of the North Pole of the Moon to fill the Great Lakes. You know, there's lots of water out there. We're not going to have any problem finding water. But um, when uh, this life first appeared, this single cell life, it came with the water. As soon as there was water, there was single cell life. But that's all there was. For two and a half billion years, all the life on Earth was single cell. Nothing more complicated. And it was like, imagine um, uh, like a puffball mushroom filled with spores waiting to be fertilized. And filling up with, with untold amounts. I mean, the sea must have been a, a vast soup, you know. But it was waiting for that moment of fertilization. And then it happened. 544 million years ago, something new came into the Earth. And I'm going to pass this around so you can appreciate it. This is my little uh, Photoshop version. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, a new genetic sequence called the homeobox gene sequence, mm -hmm. abbreviated HOX, and you can look that up because it's kind of cool to see what it says about it in Google, appeared. And this is a structure that allows for the development of complex multicellular life forms. And at that time, there was a lot of them appeared. Um, here's a few examples. That was a thing. <laughs> and so was, uh, so was that. This one has got to be one of the weirdest things that ever appeared on Earth. And 
this one is so bizarre that the only name they could come up with it was to call it hallucinogenia. <laughs> In the fossils from that era, 26 entirely different phyla have been identified. There may be more by now, this is a few years ago. But of the, all of this today on Earth, half a billion years later, there's only half a dozen phyla on Earth. And, and these are, uh, well, the arthropods, the bugs, there's the uh, chordates, which includes us, everything with a backbone. There's the annelids, which is the worms. There's the, um, uh, let's see, what we got? We got the mollusks, which includes everything from clams to giant squid. Uh, we have the celenterates, which is the jellyfish and corals. But there's only half a dozen of these. And at that time, there were there were so many more. So it's like, you know, we take these seed balls for wildflower seeds, and there'll be dozens of different kinds of seeds, and you throw them out somewhere and see which ones sprout and which ones don't. And that seems to be the case. And there may be other, <coughs> other worlds out there where what sprouted were the descendants of these guys. And there'll be a completely different, different biome. So, Life is, uh, is, is extremely persistent, but for half a billion years, that moment of fertilization, in our own life, as a, when we begin life, our first beginning is as a fertilized cell, a zygote. You know, now, every one of you women is born with all the ova you will ever need. You know, you got a whole set right there from the very beginning, and every month another one is dropped out to see if it gets fertilized. And if they do, then you get so much get babies. But it's that moment of fertilization that begins that life, the uh, conception. So the conception of Gaia can be precisely dated to 544 million years ago with what's called the Cambrian explosion, or the explosion of all these diverse life forms. They have no precursors, nothing leading up to them, no gradual evolutionary emergence, just all of a sudden, kablam, all this stuff. No matter how many times, um, well, here, here's a little thing. When cells divide, you don't have you don't have a parent and then offspring, because the original one simply divides in half, and the parent cell becomes the two new daughter cells. And all the protoplasm and the DNA that were in the one are now in the two. And in the multiplication of the trillions of cells of a human body, this happens over and over, but it's all still one single organism. We remain a single being because it's the same protoplasm, it's the same DNA, and we retain a single unitary consciousness. And it's um, it's sort of like that you take a, you know a pitcher of water and you pour it into a bunch of different cups. Now it's all still the same water, and you can pour it back, and um, it still remains one complete coherent set of water. Now water has been regarded as a perfect metaphor for spirit, so it's often used that way. You talk about the river of life, the river of, of souls, all that kind of stuff. And there's, there's good reasons for that, because water is the oldest um, a complex substance, the, old, the oldest, um, uh, come on now, uh, molecule, sorry, the oldest molecule in the universe. It's older than stars, it's older than galaxies. Hydrogen and oxygen, they come together and they make water. And water throughout the universe is all the same water. It can be poured into the same ocean, it goes into the, into the atmosphere, comes down as rain, runs through our bodies, but it's all still the same water. Doesn't matter where it comes from or where it is, it's all still the same stuff. And the same is true for spirit. Spirit is also that universal thing, the fifth element, the animating force, what makes the difference between a living thing and an inanimate thing, the animation itself, is also universal. And it temporarily, um, you know, uh, it gets poured into vessels of various sizes and shapes, ourselves. But it still remains one. And if the vessels are, uh, you know, 
wrecked or destroyed, well, it can all go back wherever it came from, back to the source. So, and so does life, and so does soul. Part of the uh, essence of any living organism, <clears throat> there's two qualities that define life. One of them is reproduction. You know, life reproduces, that's what it does. It's all about that. And the other is sentience. So we, go to, we look at the reproduction of life in its countless variations. And we also have to look at the emergence of sentience. And um, everything that is alive has a degree of sentience. If you, you may question this, but it's been at the official dogma of the great monotheistic religions, for example, that only humans have souls. You know, that's it. We're, we're the only ones with souls. Although, a few years ago, the, the current Franciscan Pope, and I'm really having a hard time with this because I really don't like to like a Catholic Pope, you know, <laughs> sort of having to sometimes, I declared that as far as he was concerned, in a papal edict, animals have souls. Wow. I'm now... This may not come as, as real shocking news to most of us, because pretty much anybody who's ever been involved with animals at all knows that uh, the dogma that animals have no souls is so preposterous that you wonder why they would have credibility for anything else they say. But somehow they have. But now it's official that animals have souls. But we still associate the soul and the spirit with the brain and the mind. That's the, that's the thing. Because up until recently, our model um, was confined to that. So everything had to go on inside the head. And that's a lot of stuff what we have going on in, to go on inside our head. But at least we have a brain there. But if you get down to small scales, I love to use the example of a spider. Because there's some spiders that are so small you can barely even see them. Like just tiny little things the size of a pinhead. But, and they have no brain. A spider doesn't even have a head, let alone a brain. There's no brain, no head just a cephalothorax and a bunch of nerve clusters to run the legs. That's pretty much it. But a spider has total sentience, total intention. If you watch one in action, if you watch a web spinning spider studiously making a perfect web, if you watch a hunting spider prowling around and hunting every bit as intent as a cat hunting a mouse, you know, you see this intentionality that is the key element of sentience. That's what makes the difference between us and no matter how sophisticated our machines we may develop, they really are never going to give a shit because, you know, they're just machines. You know, we can make them that, they, that it looks like they talk and things like that, but they really don't care. They're just, you got toaster, you know. But um, every living being does. Every living being does. So we have to look at what constitutes this. There's an interesting... An interesting formula that I think is, is intriguing, and this is the basic the, the basic pattern of the human mind, brain cells, and the um, it's a network. It's a network system for communication. But this isn't just found in the human brain. Exactly the same structure is found in mushroom mycelia. I don't even see behind the floppy. There, but. So, so this is an intriguing thing to look for where we may find this sort of a, of a pattern. Might as well pass these things around too. And sometimes, sometimes those mushrooms pop up and will convey that same network of information communication to us with little extrusions that they pop up out of the ground. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Well, there's another similar pattern, networking pattern, that we are now becoming 
very familiar with, which of course is the internet, which also replicates that sort of a pattern of a transmission of communications and information across a broad spectrum. This is just a nice little computer generated diagram in comparison with that. But here's where it gets really interesting. We've now got enough uh, power in our Hubble telescopes and computing stuff to be able to map the structure of the entire cosmos, um, at least all of it that we can see for the last 14 billion years or 14 billion light years in all directions. And what we see out there at the very fringes of space and time and everything <laughs> is this. This is the pattern of the structure of the universe, the cosmos. The little tiny yellow dots, and I will pass this around, represent galaxies. And the filaments between them represent, or really are, you know, energy fields of various sorts that connect them. Not in visible light, but in things like radio waves and gamma rays and stuff. And it's not just a random splodging. It's not just spattered. It's a pattern. It's a networking pattern. Now, just to note how particularly really significant and interesting that is, it's the same pattern. What we're looking at is that the entire cosmos is a vast system of consciousness, the entire thing. And we are just a tiny little bit in that. <coughs> but consciousness, Spirit, however we want to call it, is indivisible and universal. Like the water, it doesn't matter how many separate containers you put it into, it all still remains one single vast system of consciousness. So when we get down to a smaller scale then, looking at ourselves and our life, we have to understand ourselves not as something separate from the rest of the cosmos in any way, but as a part of it, every bit the same way the individual cells in our body are part of the larger body. You know, we think of ourselves as, well, we're an organism, right? You know, and within us, well, there are other levels, you know? And within those levels, there are others, and it goes on and on. There's a little poem about this. It says, um, great fleas have smaller fleas upon their backs to bite them, and smaller fleas have lesser fleas, and so ad infinitum. And the great fleas, in turn, have greater fleas to go on, and greater fleas have greater still, and so, and so, and so on. So it's all an interlock system, and it's held together by quantum entanglement, which is what we started off with this. So everything is connected to everything else. The core essence of the wisdom of the ages is in the expression in Latin, omnia vivant, omnia inter se connexa, which is the motto of the Gray School of Wizardry, and it means Everything is alive and everything is interconnected. Down to the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest little <laughs> things. Everything is an interconnected system of layers and layers and layers. The question is, where are we? You know, we think of ourselves as being right in the middle, but there's bigger things than us and smaller things than us. But that's a point about perspective, you know, is your point of view is always going to be right in the middle. It's in the middle of time, and it's in the middle of space. So everything that we see is in all directions, not just in one. So I talked about the 37 million year cycle of extinctions. There are, there are many smaller cycles. Um, one of the ones that is... Uh, well, there's a, about a 500-year cycle of new religious archetypes that come into the world every 500 years or so. The last one was about 500 years ago, which was the Protestant Reformation. 
And uh, well, we're 500 years down the line from that, and I think we're seeing a whole new, you know, theological religious paradigm emerging with the whole Gaia vision and the entire pagan movement. So it's about that time. So we see these things happen. There's a um, the big cycle of the astrological wheel is 26,000 years, for example, for the precession of the equinoxes to come all the way around to the starting point. And we divide that, that up into 12 equal spaces, just the way we divide a day or a clock face into 12 equal portions of hours, or we divide the year into 12 months. It's 12 is a really handy number to use because it's divisible by more factors than any other number. So that's why it's, the dozen was the original model. That's why we still have 12 inches and a foot. You know, the whole metric system was not intrinsic to our way of perceiving the world. It was designed by the Romans so that their troops could count on their fingers. You know, one, two, three, four, five. You know, that's all Roman numerals are, is finger counting. That they're, not, they're totally useless for anything else. You can't add or subtract or do multiplication or division with Roman numerals which is why the um, uh, Roman Empire was eventually held back considerably in the development of mathematics or mathematics, and why during the Middle Ages, um, uh, the Jews ended up being all the bankers and stuff, because they used a, uh, the uh, Phoenician numerical system that had zeros and decimal points and stuff, and were able to do all the calculations. So there's, there's a lot of historical stuff involved there. But, so, um, the, let's see, uh, dividing 26,000 into 12, what is the length of an astronomical eon? It's, it's about sure. 2,100 or something, or whatever. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Something like that, yeah. Free sign, yeah. Yeah. So it's a little over 2,000 years. The um, part about having a, uh, a, a, a clock face is you have to know what is the midnight point or the zero point. You have to know what the starting point is because it's a circle. It could go anywhere. But if you had a clock face with, in which the numbers were all just zero, and I saw a really nice one, a really cool one, in which each one of them said now. Now, 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 now. now. That was pretty cool, but not very helpful. Uh, for the year cycle, it was originally developed on the shortest day, um, winter solstice. That was your starting point. Then you'd start over again for the next year. And we chose midnight as the zero point for the clock face because, again, it's a measurable point. So the question is, if we're looking at the great cycle of the 12 eons of the zodiac, the 26,000 year cycle, in order to know where we are at any point, you have to know what the starting point is. And this is something that in the, a few years ago, the Mayans came up with this very clever observation of a starting point that they attributed, which I find quite compelling. And they mark the starting point as that point in which the winter solstice sunrise aligns with the center of the galaxy. Now, it only comes around every 26,000 years, and it's a notable, marketable, markable point that we can tell. So that appears to be the foundation of that great cycle. But you can pick any place else on it, and various people have done so. But I like that one because it, it uh, aligning with that brought many people throughout the world into harmony because that event happened at the winter solstice sunrise, December 21st of 2012, as many of you know. Marking, according to this system, the entry into the age of Aquarius. Now, depending if you want to use a different system, you can put that anywhere you want to, and many people do, but, but this one I find really works. It aligns with the previous ages and a vision of the future. So we have that. We have However, others, and to me, the most interesting cycle, and the one that I particularly want to introduce here, is a 60-year cycle of renaissances. Every 60 years, like clockwork, from the, uh, starting with the Italian Renaissance of the 1480s, there's been a renaissance. The, and it's all always had a name, the Italian Renaissance, the age of ex exploration in the 1540s when Sailors had gone all over the world and started bringing back all this different cultural impact and mixing it up. It was a huge, exciting event. And that gave rise to the next one in the 1600s, which was the English Renaissance with Shakespeare and Elizabethan stuff and all that Renaissance. 60 years later, starting in 1660, is the Scientific Revolution, 
That was the year of the founding of the Royal Academy. Isaac Newton and all kinds of other people were very significant. And a major innovation technologically was lens crafting, and able to build telescopes and eventually microscopes to see beyond the world that people knew. That was in the 1660s. 60 years later was the 1720s, a period called the Great Enlightenment in Europe that inspired a young Benjamin Franklin in his 20s, who was over there at the time, to bring these ideas back to America and um, inaugurate the next one in the 1780s, which they called the Age of Reason and gave rise to the French and American revolutions. 60 years later was the 1840s, the transcendentalist period, all the communes and all the poetry and, and Whitman and Swinburne and, and all that kind of stuff came out of that area. It was a terrific foment of stuff. Sex and drugs and rock and roll all over the place. 60 years later, the turn of the century was the golden dawn, the founding of all the great magical orders and societies and an attempt to kind of codify the principles and precepts of magical stuff. 60 years later, some of us go back that far, was the psychedelic 60s, in which all of the movements that have shaped the world since began. You know, the civil rights movement, the sexual freedom movement, the women's movement, the psychedelic movement, certainly a social justice movement, and of course, the pagan movement. All of these things began in that foment of the 60s. Now it doesn't, I'm, I'm sure that you're, you're running ahead of me here. <laughs> right? Because next year is 2020, and that begins the next cycle. And a good part of what we are in a great position to do as magical people, and especially since this is part of the theme here, is to be creating that 2020 vision, great term, right? That will shape this next cycle. Because each of these cycles, each of these epics, these are not shaped by forces of nature. These are shaped by forces of consciousness. They are shaped by the stories and the things that people come to envision and believe in. And here, here's a great example of how that kind of magic works. And, and I really love this one. Back in the uh, first half of the last century, the, uh, well actually from World War II, the invention of nuclear weapons and nuclear warfare uh, brought up the concept of a vision of a global nuclear holocaust that was so pervasive and so inevitable that when George Powell made a movie in 1960 of the novel The Time Machine, which had been written at the turn of the century, he had the time traveler make a stop in modern times. Of course you would do that. You're making a movie, right? You want to show him to see how much has changed. And he, he, he pulls to a stop in downtown London. The house he'd been in is gone. Lots of changes have happened. And there's a date on the chronometer on the dashboard that says um, uh, August 9th, 1966. Six years later, six years after the movie was made. And the big thing that happens is he gets out and a global nuclear holocaust is just beginning and mushroom clouds are blooming on the far side of the city and, and the earth is torn open and a volcano erupts and lava is pouring down the street and he runs and dives into the time machine and slams it into fast forward as fast as he can go just as it's encased in lava it's really hot for a few moments and then it cools down and he's in darkness for a long time racing forward until finally all the lava crumbles away and he comes out into the broad daylight and it's 10,000 years of past. Well, here's the thing. In 1960, that seemed to be the inevitable future. That was a given. Every episode of Twilight Zone, all the science fiction novels, the movies, everything, were predicated on the idea there was going to be a global nuclear holocaust and the survivors would be slugging it out with the mutants and the radioactive ruins. That was, that was the future, i.e. there wasn't going to be any. So that was a blank. After 1966, it was blank. There was nothing in that space at all. Well, August 9th of 1966 rolled around and nothing happened. And one month later, a new vision was plugged into that empty space. A vision in which we did not have that global nuclear holocaust. We got our shit together. We united all the peoples of Earth. We set out to seek out new life and new civilizations 
and you can go boldly go where no one has gone before with a multinational, multiracial crew consisting of people who, in our time, whose nations were at war with each other or in terrible relationships, and go forward to um, explore the universe. A whole new vision was created. And Gene Roddenberry was asked, what did he have in mind with the Star Trek thing? Because other than those of us who were into science fiction, the general mundane public were, what? You know? <laughs> what the hell is this stuff? You know? And he said, well, I'm trying to create a vision of the future that is so compelling that people will choose that instead of a global nuclear holocaust. Which, in fact, we did. And on Friday evenings, when Star Trek came out, not only did the Church of All Worlds have our weekly meetings yep. to, to watch Star Trek and talk about it afterwards, your pagan roots, guys, were in Star Trek, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there were lots of places, but one of them was in Star Trek. And, um, but also, they would put it up on one of the big monitors at NASA for that evening. You know, so all the all the people working on the space program. This was before the first landing on the moon, which happened a year later. Think of that. This is a year before the first landing on the moon. This show is out showing us not only landing on the moon, but going beyond the farthest stars. You know, and um, it inspired people. You know, everybody looked at that and said, "Wow, that's really cool. That's the kind of future I want." And they started figuring out, well, what would it take to get there? For example, the single most iconic image in the entire show <clears throat> is now something we all carry around in our pockets. Yeah. Only this works a whole lot better. All this was was a phone, you know, and a, and a locator for a transporter beam. These things can do everything. Now here's the thing, that's only that thick. How can there be room in here for all of that stuff? How is there a mapping system and language changing things and photography and images and internet and contact and email and all the many, 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 many things that are in that. Satellites. Yeah, well, but there's no satellite in here. No, you can take this apart connect. and look for one. Connect. Yes. Magic. Magic. Exactly. <laughs> it connects. It connects. And now the new model that we're seeing for the way the human brain and consciousness operate is not a model <laughs> in which we are a container for all that stuff any more than this is a container for everything in it. But a a portal, a um, uh, you know, a way to connect with the larger amount of stuff that is collected, the stuff that is represented in those pictures, you know, there, this vaster thing. We're developing a, another type of consciousness to add to our own, a kind of electronic linking in with the greater consciousness, and we just keep doing it. Just just yesterday, um, Elon Musk set up something like sixty odd new communications satellites for a whole new uh, plan they have of, of, of having communications and internet global so that even in the backwoods of oh some place like say North Korea people will still be able to plug into the internet which is going to change the world in dramatic ways as it already has where we have it so our what we are doing when we are apprehending the universe and all this isn't going our head we're downloading all this stuff we're receiving this stuff and then we're putting it out. And we are shaping this. Our collective consciousness, our collective vision, our collective storytelling is constantly shaping the world we live in. And the farthest fringes now of quantum physics are positing what they refer to as the simulation hypothesis. And for those of you who are science fiction fans, I know you'll recognize the elements of it, but the thesis is that we are living in a game. This is this whole thing, everything that we have perceived is, well, we look around and this looks really real, okay? It's, it's, it really is. But you know, if you put on um, those VR goggles, you know, which are not that sophisticated, but some of them are pretty cool, you know, you can be in a world that looks every bit as real as this one. If you can go to a 3D movie, you know, and in you know, IMAX, like Avatar or something like that, man, you are there, you're in the world of Pandora, it's all around you, you see it, you hear it, you know, you can even smell it in some theaters. But there is nothing actually there. The only reality is the light behind the projector that is being filtered through filters to pre present this image to us. But none of it is really real. Well, that light behind the projector 
is what we call the quantum field. And at the deepest level, underneath all that we think of as reality, I mean, you can go down, down, down into the tiniest little depths and go down to where you're down to molecules and there's just lots of empty space and down deeper to atoms and the atoms, the space between the atoms is as vast as the space between the stars and the galaxy. Vast space. You go down inside the atoms and the space is still vast space between the neutrons and the, and the neutrinos and the protons and electrons and subatomic particles. It just, it's, it's just, there's nothing there but space. And then when you zero in on any of these so-called subatomic particles, there's no physical object there. There's a, like a vortex, there's fields, there's, there's, you know, things like that. But it's like if you look at the ocean and you see the vast sea of ocean and you see waves popping up on it, you know, or surf or whirlpools and eddies. Well, these are not physical objects. You can't go out into the ocean with a bucket and scoop up a wave. You know, here I got a wave, you know, check this one out, you know, it's got points and everything. It doesn't work that way because it's a unified field, the ocean is. Well, so is the quantum field. It is one vast unified field which consists of consciousness. It is pure consciousness. We could, we like to use other words too. We can call it spirit. We can call it God. We can call it magic. But what we're talking about here is a fundamental foundation of consciousness that is the cosmos and shapes everything in it because we're all a part of it. We're just extensions. We're just little extrusions into this. <sighs> And it doesn't really matter how many of these there are. Because it's all one. It's all one consciousness. And so are we. So there is really no such thing as death, for example. Now that's just a... Uh, it's, it's like you're playing a computer game and you got your avatar and you're in there to <coughs> your avatar and then, you know, game over and you res out back to the source. Decide, well, am I going to play another game or maybe a different game? You know, we'll see what we're going to do. Could maybe re-enter this one, come back again. All of that is what's going on on a deeper level. This also means that because all of this is consciousness, we can influence it. And some of the earliest experiments that laid the foundation for quantum physics established that our consciousness itself, the very act of observation, shapes the outcome of the experiment, the reality. And this has been done over and over and over in many versions of the experiments. They've even found out that it will have a reverse factor in time. You know, if you observe something at this point, it will affect what had happened before that it started the process going, even. So it's, it's, it's really interesting, you know, it, time and space are illusory. Now, to give a good example of how that works, I'm sure you've seen some of these documentaries where they will show the world like this, and then they will show it how it looks in ultraviolet, or infrared, or radio waves, or gamma rays, or some other thing in the spectrum. And it's a completely different world, you know? I mean, we're not seeing radio waves, we're not seeing gamma rays, we're not seeing, you know, heat signatures, or any of that kind of stuff. But other beings and other creatures see into some of those spectrums. For example, um, a number of creatures, such as the pit vipers and pythons and, and boas, um, have heat sensors that allow them to see infrared. So at night, they can hunt at night, and, and warm-blooded critters just stand out like low, glowing light bulbs to them. We don't see that way. You know, butterflies and bees see into the ultraviolet. So they're seeing a completely different thing on the flowers than we see. They're seeing the way we would see these things if we showed them under a black light. That's their world. You know, and it goes on and on like that. Reality and perception are malleable. They are not fixed things. They have to do with how we see stuff. Now, right now, we've just we're just a few years into virtual reality, into virtual worlds. We we can now have some really cool games, and we and we've got some really nifty stuff with the um, the, the VR goggles and stuff that are really cool. And some places that I've I've seen have got whole things set up where you put these things on, then you go through a whole experience and you're in a completely different reality. But it's mapped to where the walls of the room and all are actually match up what you're looking at, so you can feel it as well. But you're seeing something completely different. 
we'll, we've only been doing this for a few years, and this is how we've gotten. And our little gaming worlds are getting better and better. But imagine how those are going to look in 10 more years, <laughs> or 50 years, or 100 years. I think it was only 400 years ago that Giordano Bruno was burned at the stake for the heresy of proclaiming that the sun revolved, that sorry, that the earth revolved around the sun. Burned him at the stake for this, you know, 400 years ago. Where are we going to be in 400 years from now with our virtual reality systems and stuff? Um, 2019 years ago is the beginning of the Christian era, the middle of the Roman Empire and the, the dawn of Christianity and all that stuff. Where are we going to be in another 2,000 years with this stuff? That's not even that long ago. You know? It was, um, we go back further, 5,000 years ago was the beginning of writing, you know, in Sumeria, the cuneiform and stuff. Where are we going to be in 5,000 years? 10,000 years ago was the beginning of agriculture, the beginning of the Neolithic, of, of settled communities and such like that. Where will we be in 10,000 years with this stuff we're working on now? And humanity, uh, Homo sapiens, is considered to go back about 300,000 years. So imagine that in this vast universe, with many, many other worlds, life has arisen many other places because it did not arise on Earth. It was delivered here and fertilized here and grew up here, which means that same delivery systems are going on all over the place. You know, not just here, but everywhere. You know, everywhere there is liquid water, it, is, it becomes a medium of life. If the water freezes, well, then it's, um, it waits until it thaws. I mentioned that um, all the little critters of the, of the Cambrian explosion, there was another one that came out at that time, half a billion years ago that I think is the most fascinating creature on the planet. And Neil deGrasse Tyson, in the Cosmos series that he did, he devoted an entire episode to these guys. And, and I think rightly so, he loves them too. And some of you know what I'm talking about. They're tardigrades. I see from the nodding of the heads, you get it, right? And the smiles, oh yeah, these guys. Well, these are about the size of a pinhead. Tiny little things. They've been here for half a billion years. They find them um, underneath the ice pack of uh, Antarctica, down below the miles thick of, of ice and down on the rocks. These guys are crawling around. They find them in lava pools. They find them at the bottom of the deepest depths of the ocean. They find them in the roof moss of your house. You know, they are everywhere. There's, in just the last few years, they've started getting really interested. They've identified over 1,700 different species. And they, they're probably many times that more because they're, they're just tiny little guys. Yeah. And, they're, and they're really quite cute. They're also called moss piggies or water bearers, you know, alluding to the cuteness. I think they'd make great stuffies. I think they should make great stuffies. <laughs> they're really quite adorable. I actually saw them appear on some kid's cartoon show that they were doing a thing with. And they, for those of you who've been watching the new Star Trek Discovery series, they were prominent uh, in that as well. So, um, you know, these guys have a lot going on. Because of all this stuff, NASA took some of them up into space on the space station, on the ISS, and uh, with a bunch of other hardy things. They wanted to see what might be able to live on Mars. So they took some lichen, and they took some moss, and they took, you know, some mushroom spores, and they took some tardigrades, and they put them outside. See how you do. Okay, guys, you're outside. A couple weeks later, they brought them all in. The, um, Pretty much everything was dead. Mushroom spores were still hanging in there. They were okay. They were no problem. Uh, I, Terence McKenna believes that mushroom spores are also scattered throughout the universe to raise consciousness wherever they land. And I like that. It's a cool idea, you know? I got no argument against it. I, I'll go for it. Um, but the tardigrades now, they kind of curl up in a little ball, just hanging out. When they were brought back inside and the temperature was nice and cozy, they unrolled and went about life as perfectly normal. The total vacuum of space didn't bother him. Hard radiation didn't bother him. Absolute zero temperature in, in the dark and incredibly hot in the daytime. No problem. Just trucking on. Just keep on trucking. Now the thing is that life evolves to fit the conditions in which it evolves in. 
So if you got some kind of critter that's um, covered with big, thick, heavy fur and is all white, um, it probably lives in a polar climate with lots of ice and snow. So if you got a critter that um, uh, can live in absolute zero and total vacuum and hard radiation, it had to be somewhere to evolve these characteristics that had those conditions. And there's no place down here that has those conditions, only up there. So these guys are space critters. These are spacefarers by their very nature. They're designed, well, I don't know about design is the right one, be evolved or whatever. They can live in comets and can travel from star system to star system throughout the universe. And that's what Neil deGrasse Ty Tyson talked about in that episode of Cosmos, devoted to these guys. And these little guys are all over the place and spreading life everywhere. So, you know, there's a thing called the Drake Equation that some of you may have heard about. And I hope you don't mind I'm running around with all lots of stuff because every time I see somebody nodding their head that indicates you know what I'm talking about, I'm gonna take that a little further in that direction. The Drake Equation is a series of factors to de attempt to determine, you know, whether there's life on other worlds, basically that we might communicate with. And so there's all these factors. It's a, well, how many stars are there in the galaxy? And how many of those stars have planets? And how many of those planets are in a habitable zone? And how many of those planets have water? And so on it goes. Until you get down to something like Earth. And then you say, well, there's life. And then you gotta deal with, well, the time. Life has been here for all this time. And only in the last 100 years or so have we been putting out radio signals, you know, that other people might be able to detect. You know? So there's all these, well, the first factor in the Drake equation is how many, well, the second, the first one is how many stars in the galaxy. It's about 200 million. How many of them have planets? That was a biggie. Well, we now know all of them do. How many of them are Earth-sized planets? All of them. How many of them have planets in the habitable zone? All of them. Every single one of those 200 million stars out there has Earth-like planets it can sustain liquid water. How common is water? Haha, <laughs> well, we now know it's everywhere. There's nothing more common out there than water. I mean, these are the two most common um, atoms, you know, hydrogen and oxygen, you know, and they make water. So it's, it's everywhere. So the pervasiveness of life throughout the universe has an inevitability far beyond the wildest imaginings of science fiction back years ago, you know? There's no place that we will not be finding it. Now, of course, getting it up to where we're dealing with what we might call intelligent life or civilization, that requires a few more factors, of which one of the biggest ones is time. But supposing that the life had not been exterminated all these times on Earth. Supposing, for example, that the last mass extinction that happened 65 million years ago had not happened. Well, at that time, there were critters running around that you've all seen in Jurassic Park, they call the raptors. That's actually a misnomer, they're really dinonychids. They were human-sized, they were not scaly like lizards, they were covered with feathers, and they were worm-blooded and highly intelligent, and were pack hunters, which meant that they had to have uh, sophisticated methods of communication, because on Earth today, there's only a few pack hunters, humans, wolves, dolphins, um, orcas, um, uh, Lions. 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 And um, um, a few of the dog families, hyenas, but not many. And all of them have to develop a language to communicate with and ways of, of doing that. So you've got all these factors, and they're bipedal with hands with rotatable wrists and opposable thumbs. Well, three fingers, but opposable thumbs. If they had not been wiped out by, by a mountain falling out of the sky 65 million years ago, by this time they would rule the galaxy. I mean, we only came up to the level they're at like half a million years ago. You know, it took that long for life to rebuild, to come back with that same kind of model, a bipedal, intelligent, pack hunting creature that had the ability to make things. It took a while to get that back again, but we got it back again and here we are. <clears throat> if we get another 65 million years, where will we be, you know? That's way down the line to try to imagine that. You know, we'll not only be all over this galaxy, we'll probably be all over the universe. And so would anything else that's come along in that time. But why are we not hearing this? When we turn on our radio receivers, why are we not getting radio messages from all over the universe? Well, the first thing I talked about here was quantum entanglement and how that's just the perfect method of communication. 
because anything that happens at one end happens simultaneously at the other end. In a communications device, this is called an ansible, a term that was coined by Ursula Le Guin in a science fiction novel called The Dispossessed, and has been picked up widely by other science fiction writers as the term for essentially quantum entangled communication device. But you can't eavesdrop on one of those. There's nothing in between. No signal is passing between them here and here. So any sophisticated civilization, including ourselves in another very few years, because we're already working on these devices, you know, we'll be using that kind of stuff because the communication is instantaneous, like the Star Trek subspace radio, as they call it, you know? You can't wait for a signal to go, well, just the distance between the Earth and the Sun is 93 million miles, which means, you know, uh, about eight and a half minutes for a signal to get from the Earth to the Sun and another eight and a half minutes for it to get back. Um, you know, the moon is 238,000 miles away, so there's still a delay in time. You know, Mars on its orbit, depending where it is, can be anywhere from 40 million miles to, you know, 240 million miles away. And the further away you go, the bigger the gap is. You can't wait for that signal to go back. The nearest star to us, Proxima Centauri, is a little over four light years, and we've detected that it has a planetary system. You know? Of all kinds of, including Earth-sized planets in a habitable zone, the likeliest place to go. Now, if we could send a, a, a vehicle there at half the speed of light, it could be there in nine years. If it's carrying the other end of a communications device that was designed to do what ours could do now, you know, and in a few years, imagine this. You talk in Star Trek about the transporters, you know, where you, you know, disassemble somebody and then reassemble them somewhere else. We don't need to do that because we are already on the edges of holographic uh, projections, where you can have a device that will record your image and project you holographically to some other place, like say, a conference room with a whole bunch of people, or maybe a pagan ritual at Stonehenge, right? And you're all there in your holographic forms, and you're all interacting with each other in your avatars. You're sitting comfortably at home in your living room, you know, in your underwear, but, but somewhere far away, Everybody is able to link in. Well, that place linked in at the other end, if it's by quantum entanglement, could be on the surface of Mars or Proxima Centauri 3 or anywhere in the universe instantaneously. So these are some of the places that we're on the edge of. So I mentioned that we are now uh, on the threshold of another one of these 60 year cycles beginning in the 2020s, right around the corner. This is our time to create the 2020 vision if we want to have this, because each time this comes around, a new generation of young heroes in their 20s or so, you know, step up and have work to do. And that's what all the stories are about. And the old timers who are here for the, the last time around, who were in their 20s, 60 years earlier, are now hopefully, hopefully wise elders to provide the mentorship and the guidance and the wisdom to the young generation just like in all the stories, you know, you got your young hero, you got your old wizard, you got your old wise woman. You gotta, you gotta have all the characters in place to enact the story. But the story is one that we ourselves are creating, you know, both individually and collectively. And we pass it on to our children and our children's children indefinitely. Now, as I mentioned before, each of these ages has had a name given to it, generally at that time. This one has already got a name that has been assigned to it and has been widely applied throughout the world by people who are on top of this idea. And it's being called the awakening. So this is the wake up call. You know, the, this has been the dark shadowy time before the dawn, but the new dawn is right around the corner and breaking and we will be awakening into a new world that is a manifestation of the dreams that we're dreaming now and that we will dream and that we will pass on. So dream big, guys, you know? Gene Roddenberry dreamed big and took us away from a global nuclear holocaust into a vision that expanded to include the whole universe. We can do the same because that's who we are. We are the dreamers of dreams and we are the makers of magic. And there you are, and that is my time. <laughs>